Okay. All right, so let's uh, get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, today's keynote talk. It's our, great, it's our great pleasure to have Dr. Xiaowen Hong from Microsoft as our keynote speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Hong is a world-class technology leader. He has been with Microsoft since 1995, and is now the corporate vice president of Microsoft, chairman of Microsoft's Asia Pacific R&D Group, and managing the and the managing director of Microsoft Research Asia. Uh, for those of you who started studying in, in Asia before, you know that uh, MSRA has been a place where many of the students uh, really would like to go and, and, and learn from the excellent experts there. And uh, Dr. Hong drives Microsoft's strategy for research and development activities in the Asia Pacific region, as well as the collaborations with academia. So prior to joining Microsoft Research Asia, uh, Dr. Hong was the founding member and architect of the Natural in Initi Interactive Services Division at Microsoft, where he oversaw the architectural and technical aspects of the award-winning Microsoft speech serv server product, natural user interface platform, and the uh, Microsoft assistance platform, as well as managing and delivering the statistical learning technologies and advanced search. Uh, Dr. Hong is an internationally recognized expert in speech technology. His graduate level textbook, Spoken Language Processing, is used in universities worldwide and has been cited for more than 4,000 4, times. And that's a very impressive number. Uh, Dr. Hong is a fellow of the IEEE and a distinguished scientist of Microsoft. And today he'll share with us his uh, in-depth insight on how to infuse AI into cloud computing systems. And so let's welcome Dr. Xiaowen Hong. Thank you, Professor Hong, uh, for the great introduction. So it's my great honor to be here today in the Sigmetrics uh, uh, community. Uh, I'm very excited to talk to you about how AI for system help us to build a better cloud computing system. So uh, this is outline of my talk today. I will start with some background and uh, define what I meant for AI for system. And I will use a couple of projects in Microsoft Azure Cloud to illustrate uh, the research landscape of AI for system. At the end of the talk, I will share some of our experience and the learning and uh, my thoughts on future research direction. So first, the background. We always look at quite a lot of data in building software systems, including static one like uh, source code, uh, runtime data such as code stacks, system metrics, trace, logs, profiling. The long-term data particularly are often heterogeneous uh, and high dimensional and then contain very complicated uh, dependency structure. Now let's take a moment and look back what, what's happening in the software industry in the last 10 to 15 years. One significant paradigm shift was the migration to cloud computing. In 2006, Amazon released the EC2, the cloud computing. In the next five to six years, some other company, including Microsoft, Google, IBM, Oracle, all released uh, their own cloud computing platform. Microsoft Azure came out in February 2011. Since then, uh, it has been continuous adoption curve for every business to move their uh, basic the IT infrastructure to cloud. The pandemic is actually speed up what so-called digital transformation, which is really the main reason why company really moved to the cloud computing platform because this so-called digital transformation. And our CEO Satya Nadal said late last year, we actually saw two years of digital transformation done in two months. And that speed up further digital transformation and therefore the migration to the cloud computing platform. The implication of this is a profile. It means the cloud computing platform will become part of the basic infrastructure of our society. The non-functional properties of software system will become immensely important for the platform, including availability, reliability, performance, security, etc. 
Some practitioners would go as far as saying, reliability is a feature, performance is a feature. I'm sure people in SIG metrics will agree with me. At the same time, the value of data to business has been widely accepted. This data-driven culture and mentality basically enable the business to collect huge amount of data, store the data, process the data, get insight from the data and use the insight to take action to improve their existing business as well as create a new business opportunity. And this, this means the cloud computing infrastructure and service is a great playground for computer systems and the SIG metrics community because the cloud computing infrastructure really including all system aspects, all the way from file, memory system, database, computer networks, operating system, computer architecture, distributed system, fault tolerance, et cetera. And then in order to really do it right, it also touch all performance methodology, including formal mathematical modeling, analysis, instrumentation, model verification, validation, workload analysis, simulations, and then to more probabilistic, statistical, stochastic modeling and analysis. So it, it really I probably reaches the, the platform ever. And plus the data aspect means there will be huge amount of data available for research and improvement. And this background actually provides a great, great playground for AI and the machine learning to make difference. This is why the birth of AI for system. So the simply to define what AI for system means, basically leverage the AI and the machine learning technology to effectively and efficiently design and build a complex system at large, and which to address what I mentioned, availability, reliability, performance, security, efficiency, you name it. And this is highly inter, interdisciplinary research area, which you, up, which you contain the usual suspect, at least software engineering, computer system, machine learning, and data mining. And now you, you, see, the, you see the paper and related work across many different spatial interest groups or academic conferences. Here is just a sample list of, you, you will see the AI, for system related research work and the publication. And earlier I mentioned, we always look at a lot of data when we build a software system. So in a way we kind of move from human intelligence for system. We use human intelligence, look at the data, come up with the best system design to so-called AI for system. And that also means we actually come from a deterministic approach to a more stochastic approach, which is covered really all aspects in terms of system correctness, reliability, prediction, efficiency, performance. And not just the statistical, also capture statistical property at scale. And then because of statistical and the stochastic, st stochastic, we need to cope with uncertainty. No AI system is ever will give you 100%. Right. Even we talk about three nine four nine five nine, it's still not one hundred percent. Right. So how do we model that? Right. This become a, 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 a huge challenge. And the other aspect is in the old system design, we typically optimize for well, very famous average case or worst case or base case. Now we actually have the chance we can optimize for every workload because we can take advantage of the power of this pattern recognition, this statistical pattern recognition in AI and the machine learning. So we can turn this data driven into a workload driven. And I like to use, I often like to use this kind of feedback loop to explain uh, a system or, or any human, or in, even in social system, right? in any system, I mean, or in all human uh, advance, we always using the actuator to change the world, and we actually put the sensor to collect data. Then we analyze the data. Then we make decision to come up with a new hypothesis, come up with a new system. Every time we close the loop, we can improve the system. 
right? This is how really every system, well, the so-called feedback loop, how this works. Just in the past, the analysis, the most important part, the analysis and decision part are typically done in our, our head, our brain. And we do look at a lot of data. And now with the huge amount of data, there's a chance we can automate many of these analysis and the decision step. So from the HI human intelligence for system to the AI for system. Scenario, I actually put in the four big category. This is also how I organize today's talk, particularly when I talk about exemplary uh, project at Microsoft. The first one is so-called anomaly detection. We want to really detect anomaly, something abnormal, right? And then typically based on some KPI, which is the segmentary community is very familiar with. And also sometimes also could be resource because we always have to fix resource, whether it's VM, memory, call, uh, nodes, server, right? And then second, the, the second big category is the triage diagnosis. Once you find there's a problem, there's an anomaly, of course you want to diagnose it. You want to fix it, right? Before you can fix it, you want to really triage and diagnosis. So how can we actually make it automatic? And even better, try to find the clue for people, because I mean, people still need to involve, particularly if you have a bug you need to fix. And can you, can you also suggest some solution, possible solution? Third one is a prediction, right? I mean, I mean, if we can pre predict the future, right? The prediction is so important because future is always unknown. The future demand, right? And then the future hardware software value, capacity planning, and then how can, if we can predict, we can prevent, right? I mean, this is why in many different areas uh, in manufacturing, we talk about predict, predictive maintenance. So we can do preventive maintenance, right? Uh, we can actually do something before the system goes down. That, and everyone know, for any, whether it's computer system or even our human body, how valuable it is. Finally, optimization. How do we do adjustment? More than just recover and the heal, right? We, how can we do a capacity infrastructure optimization? How can we do uh, auto healing? And so we can turn prediction into precision. And then these four big categories, they all have their own challenges. Detection, detection right? How the data is huge and high dimensional, and then not to mention the one big, one big burden of AI and the machine learning, you need to label a lot of data, which can be very labor intensive. How can we, how can we deal with that? Diagnosis, diagnosis is always difficult. Because if not, then we can actually build software with a few bugs, right? I mean, just simply because testing and diagnosis is just so difficult. Prediction, prediction, Predict future is always hard, not to mention in a dynamic world, anything can change, right? I mean, so the, to predict steady, steady state, to predict steady process is one thing. To, to predict a dynamic system is, is, is always very, very challenging. Optimization, we all want to do optimization, but when you have fixed resource, the optimization problem typically is NP hard. And then this multiple constraint, uh, combinatorial research, not to mention you, you cannot take too much time, right? I mean, we want all to optimize, but you, if you take forever to optimize, then it's not optimal. Actually, all cloud provider uh, company at, all have the project related to this fourth category. Here is just a, a list of related project, which is, uh, most of them are published in literature and academic conference. And today I'm going to use the project happening in Microsoft in all these four categories to illustrate uh, how we use AI for system to improve the cloud system at large. And then hopefully from those examples, we can actually find the insight and also the future research direction. The first one on the dictation. Uh, what I'm going to, going to talk about is something we call Gandalf 
solve safe uh, deployment. We, we all know, I mean, once you move things to cloud, the cloud un unavailable, the downtime, right? Uh, breakout will cause a huge, huge impact in the society because everyone all depend on the, the, this cloud infrastructure. And I think in the last, well, whatever, five to 10 years, you, 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 the, fortunately, it's not very often, but when, you, when, there's a, when there's a breakout, you will hear that. Right? Every major uh, cloud provider all have that experience. And, and then I think the, and that created a huge problem for the, the tenant, for our customer, in turn, for the customer they serve, they say, they serve. And then, and then many of, and then guess what? A lot of this breakout causing by unsafe deployment. We all know software had, to, we need to update software. We need to fix bug, right? We need to have a patch. So we always need to update software, right? And then this is called deployment. And, but if, the, if we actually fix one bug and causing the system to go down, then I think the cost is just too high. This is why the every cloud provider are very, have a very dedicated and the careful process for them to do deploy, deployment management, uh, the process. And typically take a more than a month and go through a stage, like, um, like, like in a test-based stage, they only do um, a few a few server, a few nodes, they actually get to uh, the more uh, the, the more, more server, more Slack, I mean, in doing the internal deployment, then they do beta, they hope, hope the, eventually they, they do the whole free uh, deployment. And obviously, it's a very labor intensive and also very time consuming, not to mention sometimes also be error prone. So the goal is very simple. We want to increase the deployment safety. At the same time, we want to reduce the amount of time to validate. And we, and so the solution is, we want a solution to hopefully we can do automatic anomaly detection. So which will give us the hint, what type of deployment we need to watch out more or even defer or abandon the deployment. And we want that method to be effective. And then the, the, at the end of the day, we want automate as much as we could so we can reduce a lot of manual effort. Uh, so the approach we do is exactly the automatically uh, uh, anomaly detection. So we actually collect a lot of data for log, sensor, event, and the resource. Then we try to detect the anomaly. Once we detect anomaly, that's not, not the end of story. We also need to do assessment whether that anomaly really will cause the, the, the downtime. If yes, of course we stop. If not, we probably still get, we will still let this through. So the challenge of anomaly detection is the huge amount of heterogeneous data, as we just mentioned. And, and also remember labeling, earlier I mentioned that the AI and machine learning require labeling. If you require labeling of other data, then it just takes too much effort to develop the purpose of doing automatic anomaly detection. So in order to solve this, we use the transfer learning. So fortunately, there are a lot of the uh, data published in the, old, in the public space by some of those uh, cloud providers, including Microsoft and for academic research. So there are all these KPI telemetry data, uh, including CPU memory, IO latency, network delay, those kinds of, those kind of data on the, uh, in, the, in the public domain, we can actually use it to boost our uh, training so that's save a lot of labeling step. Then we use active learning to actually proactively suggest the most effective data to be labeled. So by doing so, we only need to do, we only need to label 0.1% of the data in order to build an effective system. And then, and that's not enough. The other thing also, the, in the tra transfer learning, Typically, they are based only on spatial distance and probability distribution. They are not looking at the time series 
time order aspect. And then in most of this, the data generated uh, by the system, they are all time series by nature. How do we capture those time series feature and dependency and awareness? It's a, it will be a key. So we actually do some clustering on the older aware time series data. So we can, we can actually do a better job uh, by narrowing the difference between training and the testing. So when we, earlier I mentioned we do the active learning. Basically, we try to look at the data. We actually have trouble to do a good classification we call uncertainty. Those are the candidate of data we, we want to uh, label. The other one is we're using the time series pattern uh, diversity to cluster similar data pattern together. So that we don't need to uh, label uh, the, the repetitive data pattern. By doing so, this is why how we reach, we only need to label 0.1% of the data to achieve the good result. And, and like I say, even you find something has a chance you go into an anomaly state, doesn't mean they will fail. Eventual system fail can cause by the system, can cause by hardware, can even cause by network. So, so we need to also do a good job of assessment to really stop the, the true troublesome uh, deployment, not to stop any deployment which is just causing some anomaly. So we actually decide to do a voting scheme. So the idea here is that basically if there, if we, we, if there is an anomaly happened before the deployment, we actually think this anomaly is nothing to do with that we want to stop the, the deployment. So we actually kind of vote that yes, kind of sums up. If there's an anomaly after a deployment, then we know this must be correlated. So we kind of vote some down. Based on that, we use a statistic method to do this multiple voting scheme. By doing so, here's the result. We are able to, uh, be, uh, oh, by, by the way, because this is um, trying to capture the bad deployment, we try to optimize for recall. So, so our system actually, fortunately, we can actually capture 100% of recall to capture all the bad actors, bad deployment. So that even though we sacrifice the precision, not 100%, 92.5%. So we are capture all the 100, uh, within, within uh, the, the data we have, we capture all the uh, better deployment candidate. And also by doing so, we, because the automatic anomaly detection and all the technology we use, we are able to cut the deployment time, traditional take a month, now only 10 days by 60%. We actually talk, so for people want to know more detail about what we do in Gandalf, Gandalf project, here are two papers we publish related to this uh, project. So now on diagnosis, now we finish the detection on diagnosis. We, uh, the, the, the project I try to introduce to you is the log 3C identify impactful service system problem by log analysis. So we, we, we mentioned the cloud outage, it had, will create a huge impact. I think here is a, yet another report from Lloyd, like the uh, a cloud outage for three to six days could result in a total loss of almost $20 billion. So we, we, we just know, I mean, the, how, how important uh, the, the, this work is. I think on this cloud work, I think the one satisfaction is once we solve this, the impact in terms of uh, uh, customer impacted workload or in terms of money loss, it's just huge. I mean, every time you can really save those kind of loss, you, you just feel good. So traditionally, when we build software system, we have this debugging tool, a human trying to con consume those structural uh, debugging information. But over more and more in this distributed system, cloud system, I think that's not practical. It's just too complicated. I think very difficult to look at this debugging tool to try to actually find the bug or root cause. Instead, people doing what's so-called log analysis. 
So we actually write another log to recall the status of the system. So from the log, hopefully we can actually find the diagnosis information. And now can we do automatic log analysis? So that's basically very simple motivation. And, but the problem for log analysis is you don't have label. It's impossible to label. So I think clustering will be the very first step. If we can cluster the, those huge amount of the time series, the series of data into some manageable class, cluster, even we want to do the labeling, then it's more doable and the, the achievable. So, the, and, and talking about clustering, the challenge of this is the volume is huge. Even doing clustering of huge data, it will take a, a long time. And simply doing a clustering would not, would not work. And also the log data is also highly imbalanced because most of the time, we, when we talk about 5.9, 99.999, means most of the time the systems are fine which you mean when you train the AI and the machine learning system, you actually have more positive example in negative example. Then now if you actually just predict everything is positive, you, you are 99.999% correct, right? That, that, that is considered a good uh, classifier, but do you know good, right? So this imbalance problem is, is, the, is the challenge we need to fix. So this is why we do something called cascade clustering. I will describe that. And the other thing, once you do a clustering is alone, it's still not very useful. So we need to do correlation analysis. So combine these two, we call it log 3C. Stand for cascading, 1C, clustering, second C, and the correlation analysis, 3C. So here is the overall, uh, the, the summary of the approach. The first thing we need to do is log passing. We need to actually pass those, those unstructured log file into something more like a label, like a sequence, right? And then with the uh, associate ID. So that, that's, that's basically what the log passing, passing is do. Once you do a log passing, then you can turn this into a, some kind of matrix, uh, like even some kind of big vector matrix, because once you can actually uh, label them into an event sequence, then it's easier to, to process the, the data uh, for clustering. So we, we call sequence vectorization. Now, on cluster, cluster this huge amount of data will take a long time. So instead, we do it so-called cascade, cascading clustering. What I mean is we do it some sampling trying to do clustering on a small amount of sample. Then based on this cluster, we try to cluster the data. And then for a, lot, for a lot of data, we just cluster into the right category, which is fine. But for those outliers or the distortion become too big, we can define the distortion. We call them mi uh, mismatch data. And for those, we go back and to actually create a new cluster. So we update doing this iterative. The, by doing so, we can save a lot of clustering time. And later on, we'll find out, actually surprisingly, this even gives us a better uh, AQs, which is kind of counterintuitive, but I will explain. And then once you have this clustering, then we try to do correlation with corresponding KPI. And, and like I said, uh, in order to do diagnosis, you really want to find the log file which you give you the big change of the KPI, degradation of the KPI, because that really is a good signal about something goes wrong to help you to the diagnosis. So this is our experiment setup. And we basically take, uh, this is the data set which will take five particular day. We actually system have some trouble. We trying to do is our auto diagnosis. And we use the log 3C uh, to compare with log 3C SC. SC means standard clustering instead of uh, cascade clustering. <laughs> and then as expected, log 3C improved the performance of the, the, the problem uh, 
a lot. The saving, I mean, is like the hundreds to thousands, actually more than thousands times the, the saving in terms of uh, this cascade, uh, the, the clustering. And then if you look at the AQC, it's even better than the full hierarchical uh, standard clustering. The reason is, the earlier I mentioned the imbalance problem. So because the majority of the log file corresponded to a healthy uh, state, the unhealthy state, the problematic uh, state is the outlier, has a long tail. Now, if you use traditional clustering, it will just not do a very good job on the long tail, simply because the, they are very in, 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 infrequent. But because we do cascade clustering, when we do sampling, we will mostly sample those dry state initially. And those outliers, they will be, will be spot, spotted or catch because in those outliers, we will create specific cluster for those outliers. And that's exactly what we want to do. Because once you do that, then you can, then you are easy to identify and correlate with the, uh, the de degradation of the KPI. So this is why uh, the, the, this cascade clustering not only give us the saving of thousand, three order magnitude of the saving time, also give us a better accuracy and performance. So, so I can explain and how this, this is a very successful story in, in Asia. So we are able to use this log 3C to help our uh, developer to actually uh, find the, the, the root cause the pop for the problem uh, for the, the, so by doing this auto diagnosis. And then now it's applied in Azure, those ICE, uh, infrastructure as service, uh, platform as service, also our uh, SaaS software as service start like in all 365 and, and window. So third category is prediction. prediction. I think the AI and the ML is the, the strength is to really, really predict based on the pattern recognition to predict the future. And then, so the, the one we applied, the project going, I'm going to describe is a well-start department, the this to failure prediction. So hardware issue are one of the top reason VN goes down. And when VN goes down and you need to reboot the VN or the VN cannot be sold, it's, it's, it's really, uh, the, the some of the most common the problem when we actually run the cloud service. And then guess what? Disk value contribute most to this hardware issue and the VM goes down. And then, so now basically we have, we collect the data, the feature uh, to represent the status of the disk. Now we just need to give them a label, whether it's zero or one. The one means healthy, zero means it's about to go down, there has some problem. So I mentioned this is where study problem. Look, there are so many paper uh, the working on this disk value prediction right, in the academics, right, I mean, uh, in the last 10 years. And many use uh, traditional machine learning uh, technique. And recently they are also using the uh, deep learning on, on this. And this also creates some, we also have some data we actually can use, which is very nice. So, so the data basically uh, the we we include of course some ID and also the smart and, and people work on this area will know smart stand for uh, uh, self monitoring analysis and reporting technology in for hard disk each hard disk will always come with those kind of smart data we of course we include that we also uh, collect some system related attribute which can help identify the status of the disk. For instance, page error, file system error, device reset, telemetry loss, etc. So the observation number two, we find the disk value typically occur in cluster, means they can impact by its neighboring disk. They are correlated to the, the disk because we know a set of disks can be in the same disk array, or they can be associated with the same server or manage the 
same data access and all be, can be associated with the same computing node. So this is why we come up with something called neighborhood aware component underlying and this is called NTAA. The, we, we use this to actually model the neighboring uh, interdependency of the hard disk. And then, and, and similar to the previous one I talked about log analysis, uh, majority of the disk, same thing just like the uh, availability problem, majority of the status are healthy. Actually, the, just give you a statistics, the ratio of faulty disk to healthy disk some is some some something like the three to ten thousand. So majority of the disk are healthy. So you don't really have a lot of negative data. So in order to get the more negative data, we're trying to do temporal progressive sampling on those uh, faulty disks to actually uh, uh, the, the counterbalance the in, imbalance uh, in 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 the uh, training data problem. So this the problem the the, the technology we call TPS. Temporal progressive sampling. And in our neural net infrastructure, we basically using a neighborhood aware attention model. In, and although we call the ne neighborhood aware attention model, it's actually also captured temporal, temporal uh, attention because the, the disk value occur over time. And the most variable stuff is for you to predict. It's not, it's not for you to identify whether this is right in the, in the failure stage. So we want to capture the temporal dependency for hopefully we can predict those disk failure ahead of time. So the, this is our uh, neural net, uh, the, the structure, uh, NTAN, to do both temporal and also the neighbor, neighborhood aware attention. So this is the experiment setup. So we actually compare with all different uh, machine learning methods, including traditional machine learning and the deep learning. And then the data set, we, we use the one public data set. We also use two Microsoft specific data set to evaluate. And then in all experiments, we see NTAN outperform all other machine learning methods. And then if we combine NTAN plus TPS, temporal progressive sampling, then the result, even uh, the boost by another notch. So same result on public data set. So we actually very consistent. So this means this approach is really effective. We also uh, uh, try, like I said, TPS, like the uh, trying to toggle. There are multiple ways to toggle the data imbalance problem. We use temporal progressive sampling. There are also other methods, for instance, clustering based method, latest sampling method, weight adjust based, based cost sensitive method. And we also compare against those. And it, they also show better performance. Now, uh, the impact of this value uh, the disk value prediction is just a very necessary be beginning because you predict they will fail, does not mean they will fail. And even the welfare may be a long time in the, in, uh, in the future. So you don't really need to reboot right away. So how do we, how, how should we actually deal with that? Let's go into the next project, going hand, hand in hand with the previous project, some we call Naya. So the Naya is trying to do a predictive and adaptive failure migration, basically the action part uh, in the, to avoid the cloud VN interruption. So let's look at the option one. When we see a disk might fail, now we can do the, the option one can do, okay, for incoming VM, we don't allocate. But for unused VM, we will deallocate. And when the failure truly happened, we reboot the machine and then we also migrate the VM. So the advantage of this option is not the old VM got reboot because the VM continue long. I mean, because some of those disks might, ne might never fail. So you can shorten the VM downtime, but, but eventually when you need to do it, all the VM on that node need to reboot. So once it happens, the cost is high. 
The option two is when the uh, when we actually predict the when we predict the disk will fail, we actually start migrate live migrate eligible VN. But for some other VN, we don't migrate until because some of this VN might actually just long it cost. So uh, for seven days, for instance, and then they automatically they just finish without you to reboot it, right? So you can save a lot of reboot, right? So you're trying to identify that. And then so that, and, the, and this, this option is certainly different than option one, but it depends on the type of workload, which is, is difficult to predict. So the insight is in a heterogeneous ever change cloud system, the effect of your decision is often stochastic, right? It's not deterministic. It's highly depend on the production workload. So our solution is continuous probabilistic online minimization of customer impact. Okay, let me explain what this means. So it's looking like this system. So we have a prediction system I just described. Now in the decision, we are actually doing a multi-arm bandit. What is multi-arm bandit? Basically you, you have a multiple choice of action you can pick. So that's cool. So almost like you do, you go into a Las Vegas, you actually trying to pull a slot machine. So that's exactly what called multi unbanded. Each one compete with each other, but you need to pick one. But what, and then with some probability and stochastic process, once you pick that, eventually you will know the customer impact. Oh, then sometimes you, you, you pick the right action, the customer impact is perfect. You will give you the right feedback. If you pick the wrong action, the customer impact will show that you will give you a negative uh, reward. So through this kind of feedback system, you will learn how to pull this multi-arm bandit uh, slot machine. So that's basically how multi-arm bandit system works. So by, by doing so, we, we can actually combine a disk failure prediction system with a smart, uh, decision system, which you consider the uncertainty of your prediction, right? So, and then this, by, by combining both together, we achieve 26% over the previous strategy in terms of AIR. AIR stands for uh, the, the annual interruption rate. So we can save 26% of annual VN interruption rate. You can see how much, how much resource or money we can save. And then the, we, when we describe the multi unbanded -band, uh, system, people probably were already thinking about, how about reinforced learning? It's true. And I think the, 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 our next step is really apply the reinforced learning to a more systematic reward and the policy uh, feedback loop. And can we, I, we think this really could lead to a better optimization. So final, one, we, I want to mention another example of doing optimization is something very important called in, intelligent virtual machine pre-provisioning. So the background is, we, we know the particular for ICE, we both need to sell the VM, but VM of different size in terms of CPU, memory, and all the configuration. So the pre-provisioning pre -pro means if you always do the provisioning on demand, then people need to wait. So people are not happy. So, so the, the way is you're trying to predict the incoming pattern, you pre-provision some VM at a different size, different CPU, different memory footprint. And then once the real uh, request comes, if it match, then you already have something ready to use, go, right? And then, uh, so that's really so-called pre-provisioning. Uh, algorithm. And then two things are known. The historical demand, you know historical demand, although we don't know the future demand, but we know the historical demand. The other thing, the resource always fixed, the poor size constraint, right? This is a constraint satisfaction problem. So these two things are known. Then you try to do these two unknown. You're trying to predict these two unknown things. What's the future demand? And what's the optimized pro 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 provision? You don't want to over uh, provision. Right, but you also don't want to under right if you have changed to pre provision. So, so our approach is a fully integrated 
prediction and op optimization joint uh, uh, formation and, and, and framework. So we, so the next, uh, because the challenge is number one, always difficult to predict future B and demand. And the other thing is, no matter how you predict, your prediction must have some uncertainty. So how do you deal with this uncertainty? And, and then optimize based on fixed resource capacity is always and be complete. So here is our fully integrated prediction and optimization joint uh, system. Basically, when we do optimization, we consider the predictive result can have a Gaussian structure, have an uncertainty. And then the optimization is all similar to the previous multi on uh, uh, bandit system. We, we, we're trying to make decision, we recall the result, and we'll give feedback and to tune the hyperparameter. So that's really how we achieve this joint optimization of prediction and optimization stage. And then we compare our result uh, with our other two stage approach with different machine learning and AI system and then different optimization uh, the, the criteria and also a single decision tree, decision tree sorry, decision, uh, a single new deep DLM based decision. And then our method all come up, come up as top. And then the, the, the very similar infrastructure is also very useful for another job scheduling uh, problem, which is almost identical, almost similar, although it looks very different. It's something called deferrable VN or called SPA instance. So the SPA instance means I have a, a VN, which you can run in the next 24 or 48 hours, as long as you can find one to six hour time with the SLA. But I can, uh, for those SPA instance, those fragments, uh, cloud provider can sell and give the user some discount so they can, they, they don't need to buy the full uh, dedicated VN. That's called deferrable VN job. And then this, again, is really a prediction and optimization problem, right? The similar to the pre-provisional uh, VN. Basically, when you have incoming request, now you need to decide whether you want to give them a deferrable and the spa instance without screwed up the whole system, given there will be a new dedicated uh, VM request coming in and then and, and how much capacity, how much buffer you need and you need to dynamically adjust. So you can see how this kind of fully integrate prediction and the optimization uh, framework can actually work for this scenario. And then the challenge is also very simple, very, sorry, very similar to the uh, previous uh, uh, VM pre provisioning uh, task. The prediction has uncertainty, the optimization always NP hard, how to control the risk level and also have a continuous feedback loop. Uh, so you can do a joint prediction and optimization. Right? So here, here is the, the, the basic framework. All right. So now I finish the all the uh, four category also using the Microsoft Azure project to illustrate how AI for system can help us build a better cloud system. Now I want to have some conclusion and the learning and then the future opportunity. So the first learning is about data culture. Over the years, we have seen tremendous mindset shift toward the data driven culture in both academia and the industry, which is truly great. But we are not that yet. In practice, there are still many issues around data quality. For, is, for example, some data pipelines do not have monitoring mechanism, which may result in missing data undetected. Another example is lacking effective management on data sources and data dependency, which make AI and the machine learning algorithm less effective. The other one is about noise, noisy data, where there are too much data but majority of, of them are not helpful to, for diagnosis, which might even mislead you, mislead people into thinking something different. This issue gives rise to many research opportunities to build a better and a complete framework and tool set to support data-driven uh, deployment 
and the operation. Quite often than not, instrumentation still count as a second thought. Developer want to write code to implement new feature, but no one ever have enough interest or bandwidth to think through the design of instrument, uh, instrumentation. Nowadays, many login libraries and the tools are available for developers to use, but more difficult question may still be where to log, what to log, how can we uh, reduce the cost of instrumentation, how can we ensure the quality of telemetry data. So we must do serious research to ensure instrumentation as a first class citizen, meaning it it is as essential as writing good feature code. The other equally important research direction is to research how we can build a system to automatically suggest the changes to the corresponding instrumentation when the code changes. The second opportunity is toward proactive system design. In fact, this is the essential of what AI for system can bring. Traditionally, developers are very good at, at the design reactive action. Whether getting certain kind of signal, this means this, this mean something is happening, now I'm going to do X. But one example is the buffer management in computer cluster in the, the cloud uh, platform. So that's really our current system. Machine learning based prediction open up the door for new possibilities. It can tell developer some information about the future. For instance, what the workload will look like in a few hours, what the capacity status of cluster might look like next week, and then this, this might fail in a week, etc. With the information about the future, developer can design proactive action or component like what we illustrate in the example of project in a decision step to take, account, take into account this possibility. So taking the future status as extra input, the de decision component in the system will need to be changed. And this proactive design open up interesting research opportunities. Machine, -based, machine learning based prediction component play a key role in the pro proactive system design. Although there are many challenges in building effective prediction Model such as the issue of data quality, data imbalance, we need to keep pushing the envelope to building high quality model. I hope several examples in my talk convince you we can build highly accurate prediction model for different scenario in cloud system. It is important to define the right prediction target for a given prediction problem. For example, there is a need to predict the capacity status of computer cluster. In this case, it is not necessary to predict the exact capacity amount. Uh, predicting the available capacity level, such as a high, medium, low, may be sufficient. And also, the last but not least, some prediction model probably need to be white box to be explainable, particularly if, if there is a human decision involved. Right, or, or human can override some of the, the prediction and decision. So another huge opportunity, research opportunity is around the decision component. As, as pointed out in my talk, how to handle uncertainty associated with prediction? How will such uncertainty impact the robustness of the decision making? How do we make the uncertainty into account? All essential to how well we can really build a working system. And then in a decision, the experimentable is a must have because like I say, human often need to involve more of than the predict, often need to involve in the decision than in the prediction. Also human can override the decision simply because of that. The, to uh, have an experimentable, the, the, the decision will be very important. And as you know, today's AI, are mostly black box and unexplainable. So I think that there are a lot of work need to happen before we really have a much better solution. And 
the, the final learning is like AI for system, the data-driven approach can be extended to customer support and the depth deep too, as shown in this diagram. Microsoft is collaborating with the, some people, sorry, some people refer this extended research topic as cloud intelligence. Microsoft is collaborating with academic researcher and the industrial partner on promoting cloud intelligence research for uh, using the last two years example, two workshops on cloud intelligence was successfully held. One in AAAI last year, the other in ICSE this year. We will continue the workshop next year and we are planning to uh, have the more researcher and the partner in the system community and also a sick metrics a certain more than welcome to join us on the research of AI for system and the cloud intelligence. And I would like to close my talk with this diagram. AI is not going to replace the human intelligence. It is to augment us by providing a AI plus HI framework for us to do a better analysis and decision to do our job and to serve our customer much more effectively and efficiently than we never imagined. So thank you for your attention. This conclude my talk. Uh, and now we can have, uh, I think we have some time for some question. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hong. It's a very uh, interesting talk. So I see that uh, there is there are already questions coming in. So let's see. Uh, so Jenfa, yeah, please go ahead. Oh, thanks a lot for this great talk. Uh, it's a uh, very, uh, very helpful. So one question I had is that uh, when I actually talk to some researcher, especially from industry, <clears throat> the one uh, worry uh, when applying AI into systems, uh, for example, to do the resource management, uh, is that uh, it's, a, it's about the responsibility, means that if things are moving well, great. But if there are something going wrong, uh, because the AI system, especially with deep learning, is not easy to reason about the uh, the root cause. So the uh, the researcher who actually developed this might be responsible for <clears throat> the consequences of the AI system. So can you quickly comment on this part? Thank you. Yeah, so let me answer the, the, the very good question. Let me answer the following way. So uh, the every action has a consequence. So we, we take this very serious. And I think the, uh, the e even just economic, the consequence is huge, right? If you, the, like the, the example I make, if you actually predict wrongly, make something dumb, or causing a failure of SLA for, for a pay, uh, job, there will be a significant uh, economic e economic consequence for for to start with. And second thing, reputation. I mean, I think the if if a cloud provider has the the the, the negative PR on all, you I mean, and not to mention there's a there's a standard way to measure the uh, the availability and downtime, right? This uh not now actually we achieve five nine for instance ninety nine point nine nine nine. I mean which mean actually each month you can only have 25 seconds downtime, something like that. So, so, so those things have the both economic consequence and the reputation consequence, which eventually also have business and the economic consequence. So I think the, trust me, I think the, we, we actually will do all, all our best and then to, uh, to, to make sure the uh, most good thing happen, not so bad thing happen. And if that happened, if you happen more often than other people, other systems, and you will be punished in the marketplace. So I think, so, so nature, so the nature uh, progress of the competition will take care of this mostly, right? And then, and then this, but you also touch the other one is that I, I also say a few words in my uh, learning and the future the direction is the, uh, the expre explainable. So particularly in the decision part, if you look at the decision part, most of the decision today, we are not using uh, those kind of uh, black box, uh, machine learning or deep learning stuff because they are not explainable. And also you cannot have a human inter intervention, which is, see, 
which is, I think that the, it's not it's not suitable for this because I think that the uh, uh, the the you really need the human in the loop. This is why in the last slide I actually put the AI plus HI. And I, if you think about this, I uh, it's always AI plus HI. And people are talking about total automatic system. I think for steady for something more steady system, and then relatively uh, since a steady state, you can collect a lot of data, simple tasks you can build automatic system. For complicated system like a computer system or software system, I just don't think the it will, it, it will be a very long road. Of course, we should really uh, try to achieve that. Personally, I think we probably never reach the total automatic. For one, all the programs are written by people. I mean, I think the, uh, not, I mean only, only people can come up with a new algorithm writing code. There's no machine generated code. Machine generated code must be very routine not actually implement a new algorithm. So I think that I fully believe this HI, uh, AI plus HI. But remember where we start. When we start with the HI, we, we, have, we create a system that has many bugs. We're trying to debug, we're trying to diagnose. You take our time to do all this stuff, particularly the SIG, SIG metrics community. You know that, like performance, all this, all this stuff. I think that I'm really optimistic about this AI machine and you can help us building better system, maintain better system, predict more uh, upcoming uh, anomaly, help us to find more clue on this diagnosis. So we can actually build an, a, a better system and not still not the flawless system, but we will be, we, we'll be able to make a, be, build a better system, which is already happening. Thanks a lot. So I see that there are uh, a few other questions coming from the chat box. Let me just read them. So the first one, so there are a lot of works on tuning parameters, uh, performance of database, big data platforms. So mm -hmm. does uh, MSRA uh, uh, try to uh, tune the performance for system with AI while taking the system as a black box or a white box? I think we, you, you also mentioned that. So do you have any uh, experience to, to, to share or any work to point to? Yeah, I think the, I kind of already alluded to that. Uh, mostly what we do so far on the prediction part, pre whether it's a predict uh, future capacity or incoming demand or anomaly detection, we actually use the black box. But in terms of uh, tuning system parameter, making decision, and particularly for the things need can be override, can be intervened by human. Or you might even need, a, for instance, for instance uh, deployment. Whether you want to deploy something, we, we are not doing auto deployment, right? You still need human look at this to make a decision. For those, we are not using a, a black box. And I think the, if you look at the, some of my slides, even say some of this need to be extended. Uh, at the base, I will call them prob probabilistic, dual based system, like this multi arm. Uh, uh, the, the bending system, uh, when you to pull this slot machine, uh, talk, talk, talking about what kind of migration you want to do, whether you do light migration on some, and then or, or decide not to actually allocate the disk, problematic disk to the new VM request. Those are, you got to really do it more like a lure because some company, you don't want to, if you do a break bus, you could come up with some combination totally make no sense. And which, which I think the, will make the system probably harder to maintain. So, so, I, so I don't know, I wouldn't say never, but I would say it will be a long way for people to completely use the uh, break bus approach on, on something they, they are not 100% comfortable or they want some human in the loop. So that will be my prediction. Thanks. Uh, so the, the next question. Uh, so the thank you for your great talk. I have a question. So the action to take after a failure event, for example, a, a hard drive failure, being mm -hmm. predicted can greatly can actually greatly affect uh, whether this failure is actually going to happen. For example, many of these failures happen during the Ray rebuild. So is there any explicit treatment to such effects in your pipeline, or are they sort of merely deal with the with by by using just a b testing <clears throat> yeah i i think we we do have those numbers which i don't have here to share with you 
But remember, uh, when you actually go to the machine learning and AI, everything is probabilistic, right? I mean, I think the when we say we predict this this uh, based on the signal we see, there's a likelihood they will fail in the future, which is, which is actually happen to everything. Right? If you even human, even human being, right? Even, even we trying to do, uh, it's more than it's more than just system. I mean, this predictive maintenance I talk about in uh, manufacturing, which is a very common use. Elevator, all the machinery, they do a predictive predictive maintenance, basically trying to predict. Oh, this has a high chance they will break down, so they immediately send someone to look at it called preventive uh, maintenance, right? And I think the no different than uh, we as human, we wear some wearable and then we have some vital sign and then we say, oh, now this guy is probably about to catch cold or this, this, this guy about to actually have some kind of uh, medical condition. So we start, we start doing preventive thing, right? I mean, this is, I mean, the, the, the preventive care, right? We always use this, this term in the medical term, right? So all this, nothing, because the future is always, always unknown. Even we say, I have 99% confidence something will go wrong, but still have 1% that might go wrong. And not to mention, when we say go wrong, in what time period? A day, two days, a week, a month, right? We never know, right? So, so there's always this stoch stochastic uh, the nature, even we do it right, right? So, and, and I think the, uh, this is why I think the question about when we predict this value, have we ever very verified against eventually whether the disk goes uh, the, the, the down or not. I think we do have some number, which I think the, it pretty much actually uh, follow the distribution we, we anticipate, right? And, but remember, a lot of time, uh, uh, you also have a reason, even the something is not completely failure, you decide too much risk. So you actually retire some particular node or disk. Some you might even have the warranty you just replace when, when there's no job running. It's also possible. The, the, more, the, the more of this prediction, more information will really just help you to design an action and decision which, which you can uh, sustain a smaller risk and has a better return. Thanks. Uh, there, there is. Uh, I think there is one. Uh, one last question, uh, which is sort of related to what the the uh, Jeff asked you. So, applying AI-based methods to online cloud computing results in much uncertainty, which may affect SLA. So, how do you solve this problem in a practical system? Yeah, I think the tier tier approach pricing, which it already happened, like the last work I described on the SPA instance, right? So. Right. Basically, you design SLA, you, you let people, you give, give people right expectation, what kind of thing they are going to get, including uncertainty. For instance, the I think all cloud providers are selling spa instance basically say, well, you I only guarantee you one to six hour uh, continuous running SLA in the next 24 hour or next 48 hour, and I charge you less. So the, the, almost saying use as your own risk. If you have something you must finish in real time, then buy something more expensive. I guarantee you a better SOA. So I think this is this is actually the tier the tier approach. Uh, the, the 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 tier tier pricing approach. We actually uh, work pretty well, uh, and, and even for the uh, the current offering. And I think the. Uh, uh, it fits very nicely with the uh, the the way we do we do things. Interesting. Thanks a lot. That, that that's cool. So, uh, are there any other questions from the audience? All right. Yeah. If if not, I think it's it's good because the people have asked several questions. So, uh, uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Hong, for delivering this very uh, inspiring talk. I think it's it's very. Uh, it's something that's very important for for the for us to learn, uh, especially these uh, in, insights from the actually the industry the perspective. So thank you very much, especially since uh, Beijing is already very late. <laughs> Thanks a lot for staying up. No, thank and, you. I wish I wish everyone had a great conference. I mean, at least the, at least for to, for the rest of the day. <laughs> thank you very much, and also thank thank you all to the attendees for attending. Uh, this is going to conclude the, the morning sessions. And then the, uh, just, just one more thing, remember, so at 12, uh, starting in a few minutes, we are going to have the 
SRC uh, presentation, which I, I think the Julia will be chairing. And so the uh, we will encourage you to join and check out the cool research by the student uh, 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 competitors. <laughs> and all right, cool. So the thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks again to Dr. Hong. And then the, Julia, it's good to see you here. So I'm gonna hand over to you, and, and you'll be in charge. <laughs> okay, thank you.